see me? Stand up. Better sit down. Well, thank you for coming out. Uh, we're here to talk about CBD. Uh, my name is Brian Ward, and I am the founder of Sober Self and Wellness. I'm joined here by my partner, John, uh, who is, oh, you introduced yourself. <laughs> my name is John Lee. I'm a uh, I'm product developer for Sobers. And I'm also, if you've ever been to Providence Apothecary in downtown Providence Springs, um, that's one of my stores too. And one of the reasons I'm really excited to be here tonight is that in that store, I hear more questions about CBD than any other plant medicine we've ever dealt with. We've got a ton there, and this one ingredient in one plant generates more curiosity, more questions, and honestly, more misconceptions than, than any other botanical medicine we've ever dealt with. And so that's the impetus of this evening. Our goal here tonight is to answer the questions that you guys came in, but start off by talking about what CBD is, what it is not, what it does, how it's safe, how it's not safe, and just give you guys a good idea of what this might do for you. Great, yeah, so we're, we're going to go through a presentation and we're going to just talk about a lot of the different aspects of CBD. But we really want this to be a really open open discussion, so if you have questions, you know, we'll, after we go through our presentation, we'll take a lot of your questions, and the whole idea is to leave, you know, for you to leave here with knowing a lot more about CBD than you might have only had. So we're going to start with what the first question that I usually get around CBD, and that is, what is the difference between hemp and marijuana, right? And so, you know, that oftentimes these plants are, are confused with one another, and, and there's a lot of misinformation out there where people don't, can't, don't really know what the difference is. So basically, what they have in common is both hemp and marijuana are derivatives of the cannabis sativa plant. Right? And so when you hear the word cannabis, cannabis doesn't refer to marijuana, it refers to both hemp and marijuana. And if you think of them, the cannabis is the grandparent, and, and marijuana and hemp are the children of Right? They're just a subspecies. But they're, well, while they both are forms of cannabis, they're actually very different. Right? And so hemp is grown outdoors typically. It's, um, <clears throat> it's tall, leafy. Uh, it's, a, it's like a weed. Uh, it can grow naturally. It doesn't require a lot of um, nutrients. Uh, it's, it's easily grown outdoors. Uh, it's non-psychoactive. It's, it's where we get the CBD from. It's from hemp. Uh, and it's mostly legal under the 2014 Farm Bill. Now marijuana, that's kind of a, a, a version of cannabis that has been specially bred to increase the levels of THC. And THC is the, the psychoactive component that, that you find in marijuana as part of cannabis. Now hemp does have trace amounts, depending on, its, on the way that it's grown, of THC, whereas marijuana, it's, it's specifically designed, it's, it's a hybrid, it's not really a naturally occurring plant in, in what you get today. It's grown indoors under very uh, <clears throat> controlled uh, um, environment, right? The THC obviously contributes to the psychoactive feeling that a lot of people like, <laughs> some people don't. Uh, it's grown in control of, of environment and it's illegal federally. Uh, and some states like Colorado have passed legislation that makes marijuana legal. So that's the main differences between hemp and marijuana. So to drill down a little bit, talk about CBD itself. So, and I should throw a disclaimer out there. I apologize to you guys now. I'm, I'm a chemist, and so I'm going to try not to nerd out. I get really excited throwing chemical formulas and stuff up there, but I just want to give you guys a brief overview so that you appreciate actually what you know, what the chemical is, what does CBD stand for? So CBD is a, it's a cannabinoid. A cannabinoid is just a fancy name for classification of chemicals. It's a family of chemicals. And just like any family out there, there are all sorts of members of the family and all sorts of members of the family have different qualities and attributes and characteristics, okay? One of the members of the family, and by the way, there are over 60 cannabinoids found in the hemp plant. There's over 400 chemicals found in the hemp plant. So we're talking about a very, you know, like all plants, it, it's quite complicated. It's quite nuanced. But of the 60 cannabinoids that you can find in the hemp plant, one of them is CBD, cannabidol. And it is, um, it's the subject of tonight's talk. Now, 
cannabinoids as a group of fam a, a family of chemicals can be found in all sorts of different places. Your body is actually full of them right now. Okay, you produce some naturally. Have you ever heard of like the runner's high that you get? When you work out here, right, you get that runner's high. They used to think that was mostly endorphins, but what some new science is saying now, no, that's actually cannabinoids that are being produced in your body naturally. Those are called endocannabinoids. Now there's also phytocannabinoids. So phytocannabinoids are, are again, they're members of this, this chemical family that are produced in plants, hence the phyto part of that. And you might think that hemp is unique in that it contains all these cannabinoids, but it's not. There's actually a lot of plants that contain different types of cannabinoids. You guys ever heard of a very handy medicinal plant called echinacea? Okay, what do you use echinacea for? Immune system? Exactly, yeah, it's an immune stimulant. That's because of alchemides, they're cannabinoids, okay? Have you ever heard of a plant called helichrysum? The helichrysum is a beautiful plant. It's been used a long time as an antidepressant. That's a cannabinoid in there. It's not CBD, it's not THC, it's another one, cannabigiol or cannabis. I'll think that's how you say it. But anyway, it's, it's another cannabinoid. So I want you guys to, to kind of appreciate that this, this is one chemical of a larger family. And the real importance of that, how that's actually going to interact with, with your health and your body, we'll fill that in a little later when we talk about full spectrum extracts. So now, like any family, right, different members have different personalities. Some are louder than others, some are more famous than others. Probably THC is the most famous member of this family, <coughs> certainly the loudest member of the family. But again, tonight we're going to be talking about CBD. So CBD may seem like it's the new, new thing, right? Like it seems to have popped up on our radar in the last couple of years, right? Well, the truth is, hemp and CBD have been around for 10,000 years. And it, cultivation dates back 10,000 years to Taiwan. Right? And that's, you know, that's where Parker David first saw it. In 2737 BC was the first record of using hemp medicinally in China to relieve pain. And over the next 2,000 years, its use spread from the east. It was you know, it's listed as one of the sacred plants in India. Uh, it was used in, it's mentioned in Egyptian, um, I don't know if there was a hieroglyphic for it. I wonder what that would look like. But uh, there, are, <laughs> there are references to hemp in Egypt and in Greece. It's just made its way all the way across. Uh, and, and people recognized its use you know, for not only medicine, but it's, you can make all sorts of textiles out of it, clothing, rope. Um, and in 1500, Henry VIII would find his constituents that they did not grow hemp. So hemp came across the Atlantic with the colonists, and again, Virginia Assembly requires all citizens to grow hemp. In the 1700s, hemp is considered legal tender, so you can actually pay your taxes with hemp. So that'd be pretty cool. Uh, a lot of people are growing it and these days. It'd be nice if you could just send some of that to uh, the tax man in April, but we'll see. Uh, and then in 1851, hemp extract appears in the third edition of the U.S. Pharmacopoeia. This is when it starts to get really serious from, from a medicinal. So you can see all this momentum is, is happening around hemp. People have been realizing how useful of a plant it is for, for thousands of years. So then what happened? You know, why, why did it become what, you know, this, this stigma and stereotism? Well, in the late 1800s, the use of recreational mar uh, marijuana was thriving in Mexico. Right? They started to figure out you know, how you could cultivate hemp and you know, develop and into marijuana, and, and people were using it recreationally. It wasn't just in Mexico, I'm sure people were using it recreation, recreationally here as well. But in 1910, there's a Mexican Revolution, and results in a large number of Mexican immigrants coming to the States. And you know, I think there was some xenophobia, like, hey, what's going on here? And so then what we started seeing was laws started to get passed against marijuana. And so California passes the first law, isn't that a little bit ironic, because California's kind of one of the first to the <laughs> to start legalizing. They are actually one of the first states to pass a law to prohibit the use of marijuana. Uh, and so more states joined over, over the next 20 years. Now part of this, and it's not in our presentation, but part of, uh, I think, what happened, why hemp and marijuana started to get a bad rap is that there were competing industries that realized that there was such a threat to them. So the cotton industry, for example. Right, cotton, the cotton farmers didn't like hemp, right? Because they wanted people, they wanted textiles to be, be made out of cotton. 
right? And hemp was much easier to grow and easier to cultivate, and so that was seen as a threat. So um, there was a, a lobby by competing industries to, to take down hemp and, and to, to ban it, right? Because it would, it would help their own industries. So this sort of culminates in 1936. Has anybody heard of the film Reefer Madness? So this is, you know, studied in film schools. It's one of the main propaganda films of the 20th century. It's full of lies and propaganda, but again, it, it, it gives hemp and marijuana a bad name. In 1937, Congress passes the Marijuana Tax Act. This doesn't necessarily make it illegal, it just fines you for, for having it and cultivating it. But then World War II happens, and then all of a sudden, the, the government is launching the Hemp for Victory campaign. So here we go, we said it was bad, now it's good. Right, so what you're seeing is that you know people have been recognizing its use, but at the same time, people are trying to give it a bad name. Now, really, what happened was in 1970. This is when really, this is when Nixon signs the Controlled Substances Act, and this classifies all forms of cannabis as a Schedule One drug. And this is a big thing, right? Because what I talked about is you have cannabis here, and then you have hemp and you have marijuana, right? And these are different plants, right? But in 1970, the Controlled Substances Act combined them, and so they're all the same. And so that's what that's what we've been kind of suffering under for the last 40 years, right? And they're not the same. So in 2014, Obama signs the Farm Bill, which recognizes the difference between hemp and marijuana and federally allows cultivation of hemp in pro-hemp states, of which Colorado is one. So that kind of gives you an idea of where we are right now. Right now there's another Farm Bill, 2018 Farm Bill, uh, and that will then further nationally recognize the difference between hemp and marijuana. Um, and you also saw, if you voted today, there's Amendment X. And I don't know if, if we could talk a little bit about Amendment I personally, I voted against it, and, and so what amendment, amendment X is, is it's trying to remove the Colorado definition of hemp. Now why would we want to do that? Well, we would do that because we would then be qualified under the federal government's classification of hemp. And that's what the 2018 Farm Bill will do. So if the 2018 Farm Bill classifies hemp differently from marijuana, then we could, then Colorado would be a part of that definition. But, and so that's what the, the proponents of, Act, of Amendment X were hoping for. I personally, I voted against it because I don't, I'm not sure I, that the 2018 Farm Bill is ever going to pass. Right? So right now, I feel like Colorado is a leader in the cannabis space, and I, I'm more comfortable with Colorado's definition of hemp than I am with the federal governments at this stage. So that gives you a little idea of where we are right now and how we got here. So we'll talk a little bit about how hemp has grown. Um, hemp starts from mother plants, and these mother plants are beautiful plants, and you can just cut off a little trim of it and stick it in a, and it'll turn into its own plant. And so that's typically what happens. We start with mother plants, and you can see, I don't know if you can see this picture, the mother plants to the right, and you've got the seedlings here to the left. Right? And so those little seedlings, those are called clones. They're matured indoors, under, typically under um, green, in a greenhouse. And then they're transplanted outdoor to multi-acre lots. <coughs> Anybody that's driven down I-70 towards rifles has seen all the plants out there. Right? Big, huge fields. Um, growth cycle is typically 108 to 120 days. So just think about that. You can do a whole hemp crop in four months. Right? That's just amazing. And all the stuff that you can get out of a hemp crop versus 20 years for a tree. Right? There's nothing like the paper. So in North America, plants are in the ground in June and we harvest in the end of September. So you notice all those, hand, all those plants that were growing on my 7 year old gone now. Well, now they're sitting in warehouses, drying, getting cured, and being ready to be processed. So talking a little bit more about processing. All right, so now you've got, hopefully we've convinced you there's some good stuff in, in, in hemp, right? So how do you get the stuff out? Certainly, I'm not suggesting that you eat a hemp salad. I mean, it's, we're talking about some of the longest, strongest, fibers known in the plant kingdom, right? So you can't eat the plant. So what people used to do, uh, what's, been, what's, what's been done for a long time is to simply press the seeds. If you just squish the crud out of the seeds, they're about 70% oil and you get, um, you get hemp seed oil. Now, I will warn you, there's a lot of confusion out there in the marketplace right now, which might be why you're here tonight. Hemp seed oil is not the same thing as CBD oil. Hemp seed oil is a beautiful thing. It's got a beautiful amino acid profile. It's loaded with good old omega-3 fatty acids, but it doesn't have a lot of CBD in it, okay? So when you see this cheaper alternative on the shelf that's hemp seed oil, it's not the same thing, okay?
Okay, it's not going to, you're not going to take this for your inflammation, anxiety, whatever. We're going to go over that a little later. So do keep that, that little nuance in mind. So, how do you get the good stuff out of the plant then? If you can't just brush the seeds and you can't eat the stuff, well, you have to employ the use of a solvent to pull, pull the good stuff out. Now, solvent's kind of a scary word, but you guys employ the use of a solvent when you lick your finger and wipe food off your kid's face or any time, you know, it, solvent can be something as gentle as water. There are a lot of different solvents that you can employ to pull out the good stuff from him. And I just want to take a couple of brief minutes and talk about what those solvents are, what those processes are, because this is important for reasons that we'll touch on a little later. There are a variety of ways in which you can extract CBD from a plant. And I'll be honest with you guys, I've been in the business of, of chemical extraction my whole professional career. They're not all created equal. Okay, the different products have a spectrum of prices and they have a spectrum of quality. And we'll go over that in just a little bit. So near and dear to my heart, ethanol extraction. Good old alcohol, right? Who's had a tincture before? Yeah, most people have had a tincture. Tincture is just a standard liquid extract. Ethanol, alcohol is a great solvent. It likes water-friendly stuff. It likes oil-friendly stuff. It's a good preservative. It's easy to use. It's relatively safe for consumption in, in moderation, right? Um, certainly given the dose that you would get in an ethanol type extraction. So some pros to ethanol extractions that you'll see out there. I do consider these what we call full spectrum extracts. They're pulling a lot of stuff, not just CBD. They're pulling chlorophyll, CBR, CBD, and they're pulling all the good stuff out of plant. It's a full spectrum extract. Um, it's also good in that the solvent that's being employed is relatively safe. You know, in small amounts, it's, it's, it's quite safe. It's also very easy to use. Some of the downsides to ethanol extracts is that they have a pretty pungent taste to them because you're pulling all the stuff out of there. It's kind of a blessing and a curse. They do have some of the stronger tastes. And if you're trying to create an extract that you want to make a vape pen or something out of, this, unless you're really refining these things, this isn't the, the technique you want to but you will see some of these in, in stores from time to time. So hydrocarbon extracts. Now we're going to step up the technology a little bit. So hydrocarbons can be a variety of things like hexene, benzene, toluene, all sorts of stuff like that. Those are organic solvents. They normally operate under really, really high pressure. Okay, so this very expensive, fancy looking piece of machines under a lot of pressure. You put plant matter in there, you really pump down the high pressures. And these hydrocarbons are really good. They're very effective at pulling out cannabinoids from the plant. And for this reason, this is probably the most common extract that you'll see on the shelves. Because if somebody's got $100,000 to drop on a machine and make a big industrial scale extraction facility, this is the most economical way to do it. It's also nice because the, the extract that you get, you don't really have to process a whole lot afterwards. It's relatively simple. Okay, but there is a very important nuance to this technique. So those solvents that I talked about earlier, hexene, benzene, and stuff like that, they have this really annoying habit of being very well-known carcinogens. Okay, now people will tell you that um, you can get 100% of the solvent out of there. You, you simply put another chemical in there, or you, you um, reduce the pressure and it evaporates away. Um, and again, as, as a professional in the field, I can tell you it, it, you can't get 100% of it out there will be residues. And that's why um, government agencies come in and regulate this, and they make you test it. If you're employing these techniques, you have to prove that you don't have a lot of benzene in your plant. Okay, and you're done. Now, one quick exception to this, uh, in this category is a CO2 extract. CO2, it's, your lungs are full of it right now. That's another hydrocarbon. That's one exception to this that I really, I feel pretty good about CO2 extracts. Oh, no, look at that. We got a whole slide for it. So CO2 is a hydrocarbon. If you, it's, a, it's a gas, right? But if you pump it down to really, really high pressures using the sophisticated machinery, it turns to a liquid. And again, I won't reiterate the process as it pulls out the good stuff. Um, you simply release the pressure, and you're left with a beautiful extract that's, that has no carcinogenic solvents used in it. All right, now, my, my personal favorite here are oils. Now, oils are not the most um, technologically advanced. They're, they're not the most sophisticated. Anyone can make an oil at the house, but for the same reason that I'm 
the, the, the food that you grow in your garden is higher in nutrients than anything that you're going to buy at some big box store. This is, this is my favorite technique. It does take some handcrafting. It does take um, some art to produce a good oil extract, but it does not take fancy equipment. It does not take carcinogenic solvents and stuff like that. So basically, there's many ways that you can do this. It could be as simple as simply immersing hemp oil or hemp in some oil and giving it a couple of months with some agitation, maybe some gentle heat, something like that. You produce a relatively weak extract, but it would be good extract. Or you, there's some patented techniques. Um, the Sopris products actually utilize one of these uh, patented techniques, and it. it um, it just kind of steps up the efficiency of these extractions. So again, it's very gentle. There's nothing harsh being, there's nothing harsh in the whole process. But at the end of the day, with these patented techniques, you actually get a very concentrated, very stable product. So I'm a big fan of oil, uh, oil extractions. So, you know, you've heard a couple of um, words. You've heard the whole, whole spectrum. So we haven't really talked about isolates, but so you know, these extraction processes, they can kind of fall into a couple of different types. And the big, the big difference, I think, is, is on one side you have an isolate, on one side you have a whole plant extraction. And the whole plant, you heard a full spectrum extraction. And the full spectrum extraction, that's when we're getting all of the cannabinoids, the terpenes, the chlorophyll, the plant waxes, everything that's in there. It's recognizing the original design of the plant and it's preserving that in its extraction. It's not just pulling a leaf off or pulling a branch off and just using that. It's taking that whole plant, it's honoring that plant's design, and that's how it's extracted. So, you know, some of the advantages of the whole plant include synergistic phytochemicals and terpenes. Uh, and there's a concept that's been studied a lot, and it's the entourage effect. And the entourage effect states that when combining cannabinoids and terpenes, so if you have CBD and CBG and THC, that the sum of those cannabinoids is going to provide more effective relief than just using one, than just using CBD in isolation or just using THC in isolation. So the whole plant approach is more of like a holistic approach, right? We're going to take that whole plant and we're going to use it, right? So on the other side, you have <clears throat> the isolate. And an isolate does have its advantages. And, and so the process that you get to an isolate is you'll go through an extraction, most likely a butane or a hexane extraction, and that'll leave you with, a, with an e extract that's got mostly CBD, some other junk in it as well. It'll go through another distillation process that is designed to isolate just the CBD molecule. And what you're left with is a substance that's a, kind of a crystally substance that's 99% uh, .9 CBD. Now this is what you'll hear is referred to as isolate. Now there's advantages of it. Uh, the advantage is that it's really easy to formulate with. You know, you need to make something and you need it to have 700 milligrams. Well, you just take 700 milligrams. There you go. There's no complicated math to try to figure out what's in, what's in it. Um, without any of the, the chlorophyll and, and some of the plant parts, it's got a much longer shelf life, right? So it won't, you know, won't spoil after time. And there's absolutely no THC in it. So for some people, um, the, they would need an isolate product because there actually is no THC and they could be sensitive to THC. They could be in an environment where, you know, where drug testing occurs. And even though the amounts of THC in most CBD products aren't enough to, uh, <clears throat> to register a positive on, on a drug test, it still happens. And so if you're in an environment where you just are getting tested or you just don't want to take that risk, then an isolate product is, is, is going to be safer, although it's not going to be completely safe. We can't guarantee anything when, when we're working with cannabis. Um, you know, there's been false positives, or the uh, testing <laughs> hasn't caught up. Anyway, the moral of the story is that isolates have pretty much no THC in it. Um, it's the CBD molecule. It's more the pharmaceutical approach, right? Whereas the, the full spectrum, the whole plant approach is more the holistic approach. Preserving that, all that original plant material versus just isolating the one chemical. So a good example of that that I like to use is willow bark versus aspirin. Willow bark is loaded with a substance called salicylic acid. It's also loaded with all sorts of other stuff like tannins. And Native Americans have, they, they chew white willow bark all the time for headaches, for inflammation. Same exact things that 
that you guys take aspirin for and ibuprofen for, right? And it wasn't until modern pharmacopoeia came along and said, all right, we're going to extract this one chemical, we're going to potentiate it, we're going to put it in pill form, we're going to, we're going to make it a megadose, and we're going to give it to you for your headaches, right? And who's running the side effects from, from aspirin and ibuprofen, right? Peptic ulcers, heartburn, you know, those things on their own can lead to side effects. But you can have all the white willow bark in the world for your headaches, and it will never give you. In fact, we use it to treat peptic ulcers. So it's just a good example of how an isolate and a whole plant extraction, they're fundamentally different. They, they, uh, it's, different it's different ways of thinking about medicine in your body. All right, so now let's get to some nitty gritty. What, how, what, is, what does CBD do in your body? How is it actually working? So I couldn't give a lecture about CBD without talking about the endocannabinoid system. Now your body is simply a network of systems. You've got all sorts of systems. You've got, a, um, you've got a digestive system. You've got a respiratory system, circulatory, circulatory system. And these systems are comprised of different body parts that work together to one end. They do, they, they perform a function like your, your digestive tract is a bunch of little parts that break down food. They pull out the good stuff and get it ready to distribute through the body and the bad stuff they get it ready to, to send out of the body. Right? Then there's other more nuanced systems like your, like your endocrine system. It's things like your pineal gland and your hypothalamus and, and your pancreas and your adrenal glands. You know, they, they communicate with a lot of chemicals and they do a lot of things in the body. They regulate growth rate, metabolism, reproductive cycles, and on and on and on and on. Well, there's another system here, and that's the endocannabinoid system. And actually, this has really only been in the medical text, you know, like it deserves to be in, in the last couple of decades. There's a lot of research being done on the endocannabinoid system now. And it is comprised of these receptor sites in the body that bind with cannabinoids. And the effects of the cannabinoid system actually does a lot of things in the body. It helps manage stress and anxiety at cortisol levels. It, um, it helps regulate immune function. It helps regulate in inflammation. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. There's really like a page full of things that it actually assists the body in doing. And so the endocannabinoid system is a very important system in the body. Now, one of the beautiful things, and this is really, this is really kind of unique to CBD extracts and hemp extracts, and I'm putting this in context with, with about 200 different plants that I've worked with in the past. So unlike almost all of those, those other plants, what CBD does brilliantly is that it normalizes body functions. And I could, I could go on and on with examples of this, but just to give you a couple, like if your serotonin levels are low, it actually directly, it actually um, directly stimulates serotonin receptor sites. If, you're, if certain neurons are overfiring due to anxiety and overstimulation, it actually increases the uptake of GABA and quietens those things down. And so those are examples of how CBD regulates. If, if, if something's over-operating, it brings its function down. If it's under-operating, it brings it up. And it, it does this in so many different cases. So let's take a look at a couple of them here. So the endocannabinoid system, like we talked about, does so many things. But it doesn't end there. So CBD actually operates on other body systems, not just the endocannabinoid system. We talked about serotonin. It helps regulate serotonin levels. That's one of the reasons CBD is great for stress and anxiety and it gives you a sense of well-being. Um, vanilloid receptor, it's a this little receptor in your nervous system that regulates pain perception. It's called that because vanilla extract or clove extract, if you guys have ever used it for sore teeth or anything like that, it's, a, it's an analgesic because there's a chemical in clove and in vanilla and, and CBD does this too, it blocks that receptor site and helps with pain. Uh, the GPR55 channel. So if that, if that um, receptor site is overstimulated, it causes bone reabsorption. Okay, so CBD helps block that, the overstimulation of that. So that's good for conditions like osteoporosis. Uh, PPAR has to do with cancer. So that helps um, cellular health. I mean, and again, the list goes on and on and on. So if I want you guys to take any point away from, from these couple of slides, it's that CBD doesn't act in one simple way not in a, like a pharmacological, simple way. It is a complex molecule 
that does a lot of things in the body. And that's why when you see, when you hear people like us talking about what CBD can do for you, and the list seems long, and sometimes with other people it is unrealistically long, but to give it its due credit, that list is long because it does so many different things in the body. And again, I don't want to like, I, I could spend all day on the different body systems that it, that it uh, works with, but I hope you guys have an appreciation for just how complicated this one molecule can be in the body. I think, you know, the, the, the word that, that really hits me when we're talking about this is homeostasis, right? And then CBD really helps to bring your body back into line, right? And that's what homeostasis is, bringing it back to normal. When your systems are going out of whack, and you can feel those, those symptoms in all sorts of different ways, whether it be anxiety or depression or inflammation or nausea, right? Those are signs, those are symptoms of systems that are out of whack, right? So CBD helping restore homeostasis, right? So let's go through some of the, the, the tangible examples of the benefits of CBD. And I put a little star there because I've got to say, you know, these, these statements haven't been endorsed by the Food and Drug Administration. Yeah. Disclaimer. So, you know, some of the, we'll start with analgesic, right? So, this is pain relief, right? And, and CBD has been very promising to treat neuropathic pain, which is one of the more difficult types of pain to treat. And a lot of people who are suffering from neuropathic pain have found relief with CBD. We've talked about anti-inflammatory, that could impact rheumatoid arthritis, injury recovery. I mean, I think we all have inflammation in one way or another uh, in our bodies. And, CBD really helps to, to regulate that and bring that down. Uh, antioxidant, right? So it's been known to be a more effective than vitamin C and vitamin E as antioxidants. And so that's protecting your body from the harmful environment. Right? It's cleansing your body. That's what antioxidants are doing. And anti-anemic, um, that's if you've got an upset stomach. Right? You, there's been studies that have shown that CBD can help. It's again a sign of the system not working correctly. Uh, then we talk about the mental side of things. Uh, it's anti-anxiety that can affect, obviously, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia. You know, it's bringing that 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 mental calmness, right? And we talked about how it does that through the production of serotonin and uptake of GABA. Right? These are ways in, in which it's going to help you relieve anxiety and depression. Uh, it's a neuroprotective, and so it's going to really help protect what's really most important to us, which is well, our brain cells. You know, I think keep hold on to those. Uh, and you know, so what does this mean? There's been studies showing that it can help with Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, traumatic brain injury. Uh, it's an anti-tumoral, right? And so that's that's one of the, the big use cases here. And you know, when we talk about tumors and cancer, it's again, you know, go back to the homeostasis, you know, you're growing if you have cancer, it means your cells aren't being produced correctly, right? So CBD can help regulate that cell production, and which would lower the size of tumors and actually you know, get that cell production back on track. Uh, and then we'll, lastly, we'll talk about anti-seizure. And the, you know, this CBD actually um, sort of gained a lot of its fame through a, a documentary made about a young woman named Charlotte. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. And she was suffering from over 300 debilitating seizures a day, and she was given a cannabis-based extract and you know, her, you could just watch her come back to life, and that's really what started it. And again, that's CBD. That's it's slowing those neuromotor neurons down. Or it's restoring that homeostasis. And so, um, it's been shown to really help with seizures. And there's actually been a, um, and this is really big. There's the FDA actually approved the cannabis-based medicine for certain types of epilepsy. Now, this is fantastic. This is opening up the door. Some people think that the cure for cancer is based in cannabis. So we'll see. Um, we can only hope. All right. So if we've kind of done our job so far this evening, we've kind of given you guys an idea of what CBD is, what it does in your body, the health impacts that it might be able to have for you. So I hope you guys feel a little empowered. Now the final step here is to give you guys a few tools to use when you're actually shopping for CBD. So as you know, um, as you might know, uh, the FDA has declined to regulate CBD like they do a lot of other uh, medicines. Uh, there's less regulation in this field than any other botanical medicine I deal with. And the downside of that is that anyone can basically say anything on a label. 
And you've probably run into people like this that, I mean, this is the silver bullet, right? What's your problem? Yeah, it'll fix that for sure. You know, they don't even listen to, to, to your response first, right? And so the message here is buyer beware. That's why I want to give you guys some tools, some questions to ask, some things to think about when you're out there shopping for your CBD products. Because like I said earlier, they're not all creative evil, okay? There is a wide, scary spectrum of, of good and bad products and high and low prices and stuff like that. We'll go over all that. So one of the first things you need to appreciate about hemp is, um, or you, you need to think about your hemp product is where's the hemp coming from? And that's because hemp is this, God bless its heart. It's this beautiful chemical martyr. If you plant it in diseased soil, it will soak up all the bad stuff. It soaks up heavy metals. It soaks up pesticide residues. It soaks up res uh, organic solvents, nitrates. I mean, there's a reason that Chernobyl and Fukushima are covered in hemp plants now. That they've been planted there because they're such a good phytoremediator. Now you can imagine that is a that's a beautiful quality to have in a plant, right? We appreciate that, but. When you're making medicine out of it, it, it could be it could be to detriment. So, be very cognizant of where it's coming from. Um, you know, look again. There's there's no standard. There's no seal I can tell you to look for on a label. You just need to find it. Find somebody. Ask the questions about where it's coming from, and look at the test results. Well, actually, actually, they're right here. So, one of the tools that you can utilize is these these solvent analysis. Any company worth their salt should be able to provide you with this study. They actually send off their extracts to an independent lab, sometimes more than one, and they test it and they make sure that even though the plant's grown in great soil and everything, let's just double check and make sure that it doesn't have things like cadmium and lead and nitrates and stuff like that. So look for these, um, look for these, and they should be pretty darn near zero on everything. These are actually regulated by the state somewhat. It's like the one thing that they overlook. And, um, but keep in mind, I, I, this is my personal opinion, I don't think the state limits are stringent enough. They actually just bumped up the limits for these, these toxins, but it's scary how much they bumped it up because a lot of people were performing these, these extraction techniques that I don't like, and a lot of plants were coming back dirty, and so there's a lot of push to the state to increase those limits. Um, but anyway, don't be afraid to ask for these. If a company can't provide you with an analysis of their product, it might make you think twice about, you know, if, if they can't verify what they're selling is what they say they're selling. Yeah, please. Well, what about the oils and the waters or the alcohol that you're extracting this in? Can you get a, a readout on that too? Because I've heard that you were fracking mm -hmm. and, um, or have where your oils come from, or the palm oils, or their, you know. Yeah, so that should. That is important as the hemp. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You, it'd, be, it'd be a shame to have a beautiful extract and then, and then um, you know, put in some bad uh, contaminants into it. Um, so those analysis should include everything. They should include the oils that were used in the process. They should include everything that you're getting in that pill or in that oil. Um, or in that salve, it should include everything in there as far as the CBD extract goes. And so those, those numbers should be, should be valid. They should consider all of that. Does that answer your question? Okay. Can you call that product analysis? Is that what you mean? Yes, yeah. Product, there's, there's no terminology that I can give you that like, is a universal accepted term. But if you ask for the product analysis um, or the toxin analysis, they, they'll know what you're talking about. They should be able to provide you with that. Um, yeah, next. All right, second thing to think about is dosage. So there is unfortunately kind of this arms race going on right now. It's like who can outdo, who can produce the more powerful product, right? And I've seen them on the shelves out there. <laughs> you, can get, you can get obscene doses of CBD out there. CBD is not cheap if you guys haven't noticed. Um, and so it would be silly to, to overdose yourselves. Okay, so don't get something that's too crazy. Basically, we have a rule of thumb when it comes to dosage for, for internal use, and that is start at 10 milligrams. Okay, start at 10 milligrams and then work your way up from there. Most people find that to alleviate, again, most of the symptoms that, that we work with, which is inflammation or anxiety or sleep, something like that, 
they're going to be in that 10 to 50 milligram range, usually closer to 10 to 25 to 30, something like that. And so the good thing here is that CBD is incredibly safe. There was a World Health Organization just released last year, and they, they looked at obscene doses of this in animals and in people. They looked for dependency rates. They, looked, they, were, they were digging for something bad, right? They wanted to come away from this and say, this is actually a dangerous thing, and they couldn't find anything. So it is quite safe. Don't worry about the megadoses because they're unsafe. Worry about the megadoses because it's a waste of money. Okay. Yeah. Um, for people that have uh, neurological disorders mm -hmm. or damage, mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, well, I deal with that now. Yeah. And I've I've, I've been dealing with chronic kind of pain for years um, due to some a uh, couple car wrecks along the mm -hmm. way, and then. I was born with some of these disorders that were amplified from the car wreck. Okay. And my, a couple of my medical, regular medical doctors wanted me to find a doctor that could prescribe something to help kill off some of the pain. Yeah. What would you recommend? Because unfortunately, I, you know, like with most people, you have very limited income. What would you recommend for someone in my case? So I think most of what we're saying, I think, would, would apply perfectly to what you're saying. That most neurological conditions do require a little higher dose. That's one of the kind of exceptions to this. Uh, like if you're taking it as an anti-seizure medication, something like that, those could get up in the 100 milligram or plus. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm no doctor. Brian's no doctor. Um, we may know a lot about CBD and, and final medicine and stuff, but we're no doctors. So that the, the specific dosage for those really nuanced conditions, are, that's going to come down to a, a discussion with you and hopefully doctors that's open-minded and we'll be willing to take a look at this. But, um, but again, do keep in mind it is safe to play with that dosage and, and find something that works well for you. Question. Yeah, please. Have you guys yourselves ever done any like pre and post testing as far as inflammatory markers or uh, anything like that? Yeah, um, both anecdotally myself and then so we, we carry this at Providence Apothecary too, and I deal with people, multiple people a day, and the results. Yeah. No, I mean, have you had blood or have you seen before and after? clinical evidence inflammatory markers and things like that. Right, like looking at plasma level inflammatory markers and yes. things like that. Um, I have, so I'm going to speculate a little bit here. I have no doubt those studies are out there. No, I know um, they are. I don't know. I'm, asking, I'm just asking if you guys have. I know the studies are out there. I'm asking yeah. if you have. We haven't done it. We haven't done any clinical yes, studies our, ourselves. Yes, so for health and wellness has not done any okay. medical studies. I'm just wondering if you've played like that yourselves where you have no, to be honest there is there's this is such a uh, an exciting new medical potential there's a lot of research being done out there and most of it's being driven at the university level right now and so I don't know that a, a lot of manufacturers and companies are actually doing their own research because it is it's just going nuts at the university level there's a lot of research being done yeah like that World Health Organization study. Well, anecdotally, I know you're looking more for... Yeah, no, 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 but no, no, anecdotally, I, I had a knee replacement a couple years ago, and I was suffering from inflammation still, and I needed half of it. And any time that I would go skiing or I'd bike, go hiking, it, it, it would flame up and hurt. And so I, was, I would go skiing, and I'd come back, and I'd take three, six Advil. You know, and over the course before that, I was taking nearly 12 Advil a day. And that's more what would happen is the pain would come up and I would take the Advil and the pain would go away. So what I was really doing was just treating the symptoms. But ever since I've incorporated CBD into my daily wellness routine, I don't take the Advil anymore. The inflammation doesn't come up. Right? I see it more as addressing the underlying cause and not just treating the symptoms. Right? It's more of that holistic, naturopathic approach than it is the pharmaceutical, like, oh, we have this, we're going to give you that. You know? just treating a variety of symptoms to make them go away. I think trying to restore your body's homeostasis is a great way to alleviate a lot of what we suffer from. And that's just my own personal message. Have you guys personally come like, to know any doctors that have been open-minded to this? Like my daughter has seizures and every doctor that we've gone to is not willing to 
treat her with CBDs or be open minded to CBDs and would rather yeah. like pump her full of Cat medication that yeah. <coughs> messes up her hormones. Mm -hmm. That's dead side effects. Even Children's Hospital, we've been to in Denver, you know, well, there's not enough studies on it yet, and you know, we want to give her this. Yes, the side effects are horrible. They are. And one of our partners uh, with Sofa Soft and Wellness is a vertically integrated practice in Boulder, Colorado. And he would be more than willing to talk to you about CBD and provide you CBD. Um, and, and, you know, he's very comfortable. We also, we have a doctor who's part of our team. He's not with us tonight, but his name's Dr. Andrew Cunningham. And we could connect you with him for potentially a, a consultation. You know, in, in Colorado, you, know, you don't need a prescription right. for CBD, right? So well, we want to be informed before we give it to a child. Of course. Right. We want to know what's going so on. Certainly, with the child. Certainly, with the child, it's definitely recommended to speak with a medical professional. Yeah. And there are we have many that are kind of in our community that um, that are open to cannabis-based medicines. No, I know a five-year-old who's in a trial at Children's Hospital in Denver, and because they accept federal money. They can't supply them CBD, so a mom gets it from somebody mm -hmm. in the southern part of the state. Mm -hmm. So they actually do have a trial going on for epilepsy um, for children. Yeah, we know I knew that, but when you go down there, it's so hard to well, get them to that point. Yeah, she'd rather just do a bunch of tests on Keep doing it. No, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so I just, you know, in a doctor's children, defense. They weren't willing to do that. So that's what it is. We are going to children's, and they're not willing to go to the CBDs yet. Yeah. They Doctors want to you know, they're using the genetic testing right. and all this and keep her on cap They do all that genetic testing. Yeah. Yeah. So this this is a this is a new relatively new thing, right? Doctors are using the tools they were trained to use, and um, and so you can't expect all the doctors to be well versed in, in this specific right. medicine. Um, but they, they are out there. They certainly are out there. It just it's it's going to take a little look at maybe. I think there's actually a cannabis based doctor that, that comes here on the weekends once a month. Oh yeah. Um, doctor and Kathy knows who it is. Kathy from here. So ask her about the, the doctor. He he writes a lot of prescriptions for um, medical marijuana. But he'd also be you know somebody who's very familiar with cannabis <coughs> medicine. We have member, members of the medical community within our Stokers community that mm -hmm. would be happy to mention. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it is changing. So, uh, Dr. Andrew, the last two meetings that he's done, these, these nationwide conferences that he's gone to, um, they cover a whole lot of stuff, but they've got a booth on CBD and they're answering questions and like this. And he said that at both of those meetings, the CBD booth was by far the, the busiest one. The doctors are there, they want to know. Just take a little time to. Have you had any stuff. experiences um, that you know of that people are on Western medications and they want to switch over to CBD, but mm -hmm. they're not sure about that? And of course, doctors aren't going to recommend that at the moment, not unless you have that doctor that will. So I've had people ask me, you know, what should I do? Should I help my mom who's got, you know, dementia? Try this, you know, because she's been on this and it's not doing anything, of course. And, but how does, have you had any, you know, they're like, how will it affect those medications? Sorry, are you referring mostly to like drug interactions? With yeah. Other? So again, I'm gonna say that both John and I are not doctors. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I just, um, have you had experience? From your own So, you know, the, the guidance that we have, you know, this is going through doc, Dr. Andrew, uh, as well as research that we've done on our own. Um, CBD has a similar effect to grapefruit. <clears throat> Body, right? So, have you ever taken a medicine that says, you know, don't don't take your medicine with grapefruit? Um, that's so. That's due to the inhibiting the phytochrome P450 cytochrome P450 cytochrome P450. Right. So that will actually amplify the effects of the medicine, right? Because it's inhibiting that enzyme, which helps to break down the medicine. So, if you were to take grapefruit, I think it's like Valium and the the category of the benzos. So if you were to take grapefruit and then the benzo, it's going to amplify the effect of the benzo, and you're going to knock that out and not know what we got, right? So that's the, the big interaction that we see, that we've read about and studied. Typically, you know, I've heard Andrew say a few times that dosages under 100 milligrams are generally safe, 
but talk to your doctor. You didn't hear, you know, this is, this is the doctor's. Um, but, you know, we love, our, you know, one of the purposes of SOCRIS is to try to get people off of these medicines that are, you know, with all the killer side effects, right? Sure. We'd rather see people based on all natural medicine, right? Taking a holistic approach, right? And, and getting rid of the, the SSRIs, the, the, the benzos, right? The opioids. Right? Let's get off of those things and let's get back on, on natural plant medicine. That's, that's why we exist yeah. as a company. So to give a little context to, um, like I said, I work with, with hundreds of plant medicines and Many of those have technical contraindications with medications. Um, most of those are theoretical. They've never actually been demonstrated, but there is a theoretical contraindication, um, just like with, with grapefruit. Um, so just understand that the, there's a difference between theoretical contraindications and actual fruit contraindications. Now that said, the, the doctor that we work with says that there are three main contraindications. These are the three that he says you know, you should really watch out for. One, pregnancy and nursing. So just, we don't, and that's because there's a lack of evidence. We haven't had enough studies that have shown it's safe, so let's be safe and just leave it out of pregnancy and nursing. Two is people on blood thinning, blood thinning medications, okay, like warfarin, things like that. And that is because it changes the rate which the liver processes the medication. Blood thinning medications are extremely dosage dependent. That's why you have to go get your blood tested while you're on these medications to make sure that you don't fill your blood too much. Um, and the third one is people with histories of significant liver damage. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of reasons you might have liver damage. So those are the, the big three contraindications. Um, now that doesn't mean that if, if you fall into one of those categories that this is off the table, just talk to your doctor. Um, but those, According to Andy, those are the top three. Yeah. I saw a couple of hands. Yeah, please. Could you, could you tell them the difference between taking the drops or the capsules? Good question. Do the, do the drops last forever? Do they oxidize? With they oil? do. It's an, it's an oil base. Oils eventually do oxidize with time. Um, but you get a good shelf. If, as long as you keep them at room temperature or below, keep them out of direct sunlight. Both of those enhance oxidation of the oils. Uh, keep it at room temperature, out of direct sunlight, you should get a good year out of the, the oils and the gel caps. Um, as far as the differences between those, uh, they're, they're actually extremely, they're both very, very, very similar products. The difference is that um, if you have a gel cap, uh, your dosage is kind of set. You know, you can have, if you want to say 20 milligrams, you can take two, men, two milligrams, but you're in increments of 10, right? So it's more set dose, 